sing it over that. So if you'll stand with us as we worship, Jesus, I thank you that you're a promise keeper, that you're not like man that shall lie, that you, you finish what you start. You're a promise keeper, you're trustworthy, you're faithful, you are who you say you are. And we love you in this place, God. We love you in this place. if it's in your job, if it's in your bank account, if his word says it, you will see the goodness of God. So as we go back into the bridge, I just want you to cling to this verse, sing it out, receive it, it's for you. I am standing on every promise that you make. your name. 
Let's give the promise keeper a shout of praise. Thank you, your true Jesus, to every word you speak.
sing this together there will be no one like you and no one beside you alone are worthy of all praise you Jesus, we can't sing it or say it enough that there is no one like you. And you are alone. You are worthy of all of our praise, this song and our lives. Jesus, you're just so worthy. We can't say it enough. The one that's worthy is just, you have so many names. Your character and your nature is just, there's no end, there's no cap. And your name has power. I just speak out that all of your names have power. And all of your names are alive and real, all of them. And I just pray as we sing this song, Jesus, that you would illuminate new names that maybe we haven't seen before, but today we will see them. You are a way maker. You are the promise keeper. I call you maker, you give life an eternal spark. I call you healer, you can mend any broken heart. I call you faithful father, you finish everything you start. My soul was made to respond. I know you by a thousand names And you deserve every single one You've given me a million ways To be amazed at what you've done And I am lost in wonder At all you do I know you by a thousand names And I'll sing them Yeah. 
dream your grace is patient and you're never giving up on me i call you bondage breaker cause you're handing out the prison keys my soul was there
Jesus, you are who you say you are. All of your names, you are who you say you are. And I just thank you that you've revealed yourself in new ways this morning. And I just pray you would continue to enlighten our hearts to who you are, Jesus. We love your name. We love you in this place. We give you all honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you look to someone on your left or right, give them a high five, tell them Jesus is good. There it is. A little late. <laughs> oh, perfect. Oh, thank you. Good morning, good morning. How you guys doing this morning? Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, uh, give it up for Kimberly. She's like um, super mom, super mom this morning, leading worship, her little, uh, what, uh, Luca, no, I know Luca, I know the name, how old, like a month now, three months, oh, three, <laughs> sorry, yeah, we're super tight, really close, uh, <laughs> No, welcome to the Living Stone Stewards. It's good to see you guys this morning. Uh, just got a quick couple announcements for you. Uh, if you signed up for water baptisms, it's going to be uh, this morning after church. Go down to Ali'i Drive. We're doing uh, water baptisms down there right on the water. It's going to be amazing. Um, also, do we have any baby dedications this morning? Anybody sign up for that? Nope? Perfect. Uh, also, we have uh, started our youth group. Youth group is going. Middle school is Tuesday. And uh, high school is Thursday. If you have youth that you know of, send them. It's amazing. It it's re really is. Uh, and also, kind of the lifeblood of our church is our small group. So we want to encourage everybody, sign up for a small group. Go on to livingstoneschurch.com. There's uh, uh, tons of small groups you can sign up for, anywhere from a paddle boarding small group to a uh, sermon discussion small group. You just go on there. They have all the names and faces you can sign up. And we also have physical sign-up sheets outside. Um, other than that, that's all of our announcements, as well as we're releasing the children, release the kids. Um, we also have our preteen ministry, which is uh, back in session. So, yeah, Lord, we just bless the kids right now to be released. All right. Wow, we had, like, a ton of kids. Yeah, last service. And <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> when I, uh, sorry, moving on. I want to invite uh, Sean Mitsu to come forward. Everybody give Sean a, well, a welcome. Uh, Sean is a good friend of ours, and he's literally part of the Living Stones family. He married um, a Bar Bill Barley's daughter, and so this is Bill, Bill's, Pastor Bill's uh, son-in-law. And um, living in on his, him and his family are living on Oahu in Honolulu, and they have a heart to actually uh, plant a Living Stones church plant in Honolulu. Isn't that awesome? So uh, they've started with a home group, and they got faith that it's going to turn into something uh, amazing and dynamic and faith filled. So we're believing with them here, and we're sending them out to, to, to do that. So um, I want to pray for Sean, and then we'll, we'll jump right into it. So, Lord, I just thank you so much for Sean. And thank you for his willingness to fly over here from Honolulu and share, give the word of the Lord to us um, this morning. We ask that everything that's on his heart would, would come out of his mouth. And I pray for that you would give us ears to hear and listen to what he has to share. Let it go deep and transform us from the inside out as we listen to your word this morning. As we continue our series on the book of Daniel. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Daniel. Uh, Good morning. How's everyone doing? Everyone okay? <laughs> um, I'm going to sit down if that's okay with you guys. I told the first service, my, my son, walked. we walked in uh, to church today, and my son, the first thing he, we walk up to Daniel, and he says, oh, my dad is so nervous, or he looks so nervous, yeah? And uh, man, kids, they just say it, yeah, the truth. Uh, and so... Um, I like to sit, I like to sit, it helps me feel more comfortable. Um, but thank you for having us, um, my whole family's here. Um, I think I came in the summer uh, uh, earlier this year and got to share with you guys and just, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be able to talk about the word. 
um, I'm still learning. I'm still growing uh, as a as a teacher, as a as a pastor, and um, and so I'm really grateful to to be able to do this. It's a, it really is an honor, and uh, thank you for your encouragement and for receiving me, receiving our family here uh, to be able to share this morning. So. Um, we're continuing a series on the book of Daniel, and uh, let me get my notes here. I went too long last ser- uh, sermon, so we'll, we're going to play it by ear here. Hopefully we get through it. Um, but uh, we're in a series uh, in the book of Daniel called Thriving in Babylon. Daniel Lehman, he, uh, he shared last week on uh, Daniel chapter 1. And uh, just to do a little recap on, on what he shared with us, um, he gave us a little bit of context on the background. Um, when looking in the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel's part of uh, what's called the major prophets uh, in the Bible. And it's actually the prophets, I don't know for you guys if you feel this way, but the prophets are very obscure. They're, they're books of the Bible that actually get... Uh, kind of missed a lot of times, or we don't spend as much as, of time as much as in the New Testament or the beginning of the Old Testament. Um, and, uh, but really, the, the book of Daniel and all the prophets, um, I was just, as I was studying this week and I was preparing, I just really felt like, uh, uh, what do we want to get out of this? What do we want to get out of the study um, of, of Daniel, out of the, the prophets? And I just felt like the Lord was uh, just speaking that every book, everything in the word is about knowing him. Um, and while Daniel and all the prophets uh, have a lot of obscure things, a lot of uh, predictions of the future, especially predictions of the end times, right? Daniel is kind of connected to uh, the study of the end times and we have charts and we have all these different uh, ideas of what Daniel's talking about. You know, what is the end going to be like? Yeah, what is... Uh, How's it all going to go down? Um, Bill Barley, my my father-in-law, he said something really, uh, I thought it was really good last week. He said, sometimes we get so caught up in the obscure, we miss the obvious, right? Um, And we get so caught up in all of the wanting to know what others don't and wanting to have that inside scoop uh, that we miss the obvious. And and for us this morning, I think the obvious is God wants to be known this morning. And, and he wants to equip his, his church, his bride. He wants to transform our hearts. And that's the obvious. And, and if we can um, even approach the prophetic, like the deep mysteries of God, as God revealing his heart, revealing who he is, and the obvious things, the obvious directive things in his word, God wants to be known. He wants to show, uh, show himself to us. Um, That's how we approach Daniel, and that's my encouragement, even as you guys were studying uh, uh, the book of Daniel uh, the next nine more weeks or so, uh, just to really consider this is about God revealing him, himself, revealing his heart to us. Um, God wants to show us his power over nature and history. He wants to show us his predictability that he doesn't change. He will fulfill everything that he's spoken. And we're going to read some really encouraging uh, uh, passages today, even as at the end. God wants to fulfill these things. Yeah, and I think towards the end of the series, we'll get into some of these uh, end times prophecies. God is going to fulfill everything that he's promised. Um, And then he's also flexible. The prophets, uh, they had these really challenging words, and it's just important to um, be reminded that God speaks so that we would respond. And when we respond, God actually responds, right? God didn't just set everything in stone and, and, and wind the clock uh, and just kind of set it and forget it. God is relational. He interacts with us. And so when he speaks to us, like in the prophets, he invites us to respond to him, and when we respond, he, he, he responds back, right? When we repent, when we turn, he will relent, yeah? Or he will give us mercy. He will, he will uh, provide for us. So um, hopefully we, um, uh, we, we feel that this morning, God revealing his heart to us, revealing these things about himself to us. 
Daniel uh, last week talked about historical context. Um, why the main reason why the historical context context matters is uh, we're laying out. What is the, the world that Daniel is living in? Yeah, what is the culture? What is the society he is living in? What is the challenges that Daniel is going through? Um, and when we talk about Babylon, we're talking about an uh, 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 empire that's the most powerful empire of its time. And it's synonymous with idol worship. It's synonymous with immorality. It's synonymous with uh, perversion. This really uh, is the world that Daniel's in. Um, in and for Daniel, uh, he's under a king. Where, where we're going to start today, um, he's under a king whose uh, name is synonymous with pride and cruelty. He's a prideful king, most powerful man uh, in the world at that time. Um, and he is uh, full of cruelty, as we're going to see today as we read. Okay? Um, Daniel, this is so confusing. I keep talking about Daniel Lehman and Daniel the Bible. Daniel Lehman, uh, last week, he, he introduced the idea that we want to not just survive uh, in, in this culture. We want to thrive. We want abundant life. Uh, we want a life that's marked uh, by relationship with Jesus. Um, and that means something, yeah? Um, and we don't want our lives... Uh, uh, to be filled with um, influences of the Babylonian spirit, yeah, or of Babylon, the culture that we're in, okay? Um, one more thing for context. Uh, while Babylon was a region or is a physical place, uh, Babylon in the Bible is also talked of as a spirit, yeah? Um, a spirit that manifests itself as cultural, political, and religious belief systems, Yeah? Um, Revelation tells us that the spirit of Babylon, these ideologies, these ideas, they're not going away. They're going to actually be influencing until the end of the age, yeah? And so um, Revelation tells us that uh, uh, this Babylon spirit uh, is not just the kingdom of Babylon. It's something that's been at work from the beginning and it continues to be at work today, it's going to be at work uh, till the end, till Jesus comes back. Um, Paul describes this in his letter to Timothy. He says, characteristics of the Babylon spirit or the end of the age is being lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Um, these things, these ideas are at work. They were at work in the beginning. They were at work in all of our history, Sodom and Gomorrah, Nazi Germany. Um, it continues to shape minds uh, in academia today, shape minds today. Um, it continues to influence uh, on our feeds and social media and in every single sphere Okay, um, why I'm saying this is not to discourage us. It's just to really just understand that we've all been touched by this thing. Yeah, we've all been influenced by this. Um, and I think a lot of times as Christians or believers, we can get this idea, this mentality of us and them that uh, only the world is dealing with the spirit of Babylon and we're different. We're not like that. Yeah, we, we haven't been touched by it. Um, but the reality is we live in the society that we've, we've been influenced by it. Yeah. Um, I was talking to my wife. I was trying to think of a good story to tell, but <laughs> we'll see how this goes. But um, I grew up here. I went to Calique High School and uh, I hung out with the Filipinos uh, when I went was when I was in high school, and uh, one of the things uh, the Filipinos were always the best dressed, yeah, and they always smelled really good. They they smelled like it's like they walked by and the cologne would just poof, oh man, so good, yeah. Okay, these guys were like they were the studs at school, and. I remember in eighth grade, I started hanging out with these Filipino guys, and um, my behavior started to change, or like things started to change. Number one, they all had guest watches. 
You know, we all, the only place we shopped here was Macy's. So Macy's had the guest watch and we all, they all had it. So I had to have the guest watch, you know? So I, I remember I, I spent like over a hundred dollars. I got this guest watch. Okay. And then they all got this, this gold chain and I was like, I got to have the chain. I got to have it. They got it. I got to have it. Yeah. They started wearing the Armani cologne. I said, I got to have the Armani cologne. <laughs> All at Macy's, yeah, right up here, <laughs> okay? And I got real, you know, I, I didn't think of it this way, but, you know, uh, we were influenced, right? And then um, towards, you know, during high school, I remember one day one of my Filipino friends came, and he had this look, it was just a strange look on his face, and he said, why, why are you looking like that? Yeah, what's going on? And he goes, Sean, I pierced my nipples. <laughs> Can I say that in church? That word? Yeah. Okay. He goes, Sean, I pierced them. And I remember at lunch, he showed us. And we go, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? Yeah? This kid. Um, and we all looked at each other and we went, no way, <laughs> no way. Okay. We draw the line, yeah? There's always a point that we draw the line, yeah? I drew the line, yeah? I promise you, I drew the line, okay? <laughs> and um, we do this in the church. We draw the line, right? And we say, that is the spirit of Babylon. Uh, that's not me. That's not us, yeah? And it's usually very extreme things in our culture. Um, but we've already bought the watch, and we've already bought the chain, and, and it's already a part of us. And it's the things that we're willing to compromise on uh, that we don't have sight, yeah? We cannot see. And, and so my encouragement today is just to, what can we see from Daniel that might reveal God to us, reveal our hearts to us? Um, and what can God highlight to us might be ways that Babylon has influenced us in subtle ways. Um, and then the hope is, how do we actually overcome uh, those things in our life, yeah? How do we actually live in the opposite spirit of those things? So let me pray uh, that God would come and speak, that we wouldn't just be talking and, and listening, but, we, but God would move on us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's a double-edged sword. You said that it reveals our hearts, God, that the, the word cuts through us and is able to to, to reveal our hearts. And I just pray for that this morning. Anoint your word. And I just pray that um, our hearts would be tender, our minds would be humble to hear from you today. You're alive, you're living, and you're here. And so we just acknowledge that. And uh, we invite you to move, invite you to move on our hearts, God. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're in Daniel chapter 2, and um, really, we're, I made a mistake last time. I, I read almost, I mean, I read a lot of Daniel 2, and we didn't get through a lot of uh, what we wanted to talk about. And so I'm going to try to paraphrase. Is that okay if we paraphrase? We try to, uh, uh, really, Daniel 2 is a narrative. Um, the first half of Daniel is like a historical narrative, and then the second half of the book of Daniel gets into our prophecies uh, kind of those obscure passages, okay? Um, so Daniel 2 is titled Nebuchadnezzar's Dream. And it begins with a nightmare, yeah? Nebuchadnezzar uh, has this dream and it's very troubling, yeah? You guys know those dreams that you have that just, they wake you up and you're just filled with anxiety or you're just like, what the heck? Why did I have that dream? And it sticks with you almost like it actually happened, yeah, almost like it really happened. I have one. My, my one is I, I, I used to worship lead. I have this dream. I, I, have, I, I wake or I, I get in this dream and I'm supposed to lead a worship set and I didn't prepare anything. I have no sheet music for my band and I don't even know what songs and I get on the stage and the church is there and they're ready and the time is up. It's time and we got to do this. And I just freak out, yeah? And I wake up, and it's like it actually happened. And I get all like, oh, man, I'm so irresponsible. <laughs> like, I couldn't prep the set. It's ridiculous, yeah? But the dreams really reveal uh, a lot of times the anxieties or fears that, that we have in our hearts. 
And uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. As we uh, talk about Daniel 2, I think there's three, uh, three things that show us the influence of Babylon or characteristics of Babylon. Um, when we're looking at King Nebuchadnezzar and looking at his uh, council and his magicians, um, I think there's three things that really highlight what are the um, characteristics of the spirit of Babylon, and maybe it'll highlight some of the things in our heart. Uh, number one, we can put it up here. I believe that uh, the passage is showing us that the spirit of Babylon lives from a place of fear and anxiety. Um, when I was reading this, I thought, what is the most powerful man in the world afraid of? And um, the only thing, and when we read on later, um, the thing that Nebuchadnezzar is afraid of is loss, yeah? Losing what he has. Yeah, he has everything, yeah? But he's afraid of losing what he has. And the reality is that we're all like that, that we all have a fear of loss, even if we don't have much, yeah? Even if... It's the things you don't have yet, yeah? We, we have a fear that we'll never get it, that we'll lose it, yeah? Um, and the spirit of Babylon, a life that's built on all the things that we, we're afraid of losing, yeah? Um, we really, the, the spirit of Babylon lives from this place of fear, this place of anxiety. Matthew 13, 22 uh, the parable of the sower, Jesus told us that some of the seed, the word that he, he, he throws out, some of that's gonna get caught up in weeds in our life. And he says, those weeds are the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. This idea that um, those riches, we can, uh, uh, they'll satisfy us, they'll make us happy, yeah? Um, and and uh, Jesus was telling us that those will choke out the word in our life, Yeah? Um, what areas in our life do we have fear and anxiety that we're, we're afraid of losing? Yeah, it's important to think about those things, yeah? Um, next up, Nebuchadnezzar, what he decides to do with his dream is he invites all the magicians. They're called Chaldeans at the time. He invites all the magicians, the soothsayers, his wisest people around him, and he says, come and interpret this dream for me, yeah? And... The response of the, the Chaldeans tells us another uh, way that the spirit of Babylon works. Yeah? The Chaldeans say, all right, king, tell us the dream, and then we'll interpret it for you. Yeah? And then King Nebuchadnezzar, he's smart. Yeah? He goes, no. <laughs> he goes, I'm not going to tell you the dream uh, because you're just going to uh, make stuff up. If I tell you the dream, you know, it's like a fortune cookie, right? I'm like getting ready to, for the fortune cookie to encourage me and I open it up and it tells me something generic, right? That's just like really obvious, stating the obvious, right? And that's the same thing with uh, the soothsayers, yeah? Nebuchadnezzar says, I see right through this. You're gonna just tell me what I wanna hear, yeah? And then they say it again. They say, no, tell us the dream, really. Tell us the dream and, and we'll interpret it for you. And he says, I'm not budging on this. I cannot tell you the dream. You gotta tell me the dream. And then they tell him this interesting thing. They say, you're asking of us what no other king in history would ask of anybody, yeah? Because no one knows your dream, they tell him. They say, the only one that knows the dream are the gods and they're not dwelling with flesh, the only one that can tell you the dream is the gods, and they don't care. They're not with us, yeah? Um, point two here, the spirit of Babylon offers us counterfeit truths and solutions while denying the power of God and the love of God, yeah? There's so many things that we can build our life on today. There's so many options, and I think uh, there's so many uh, if you want to live a certain way, or if you want to justify any, anything in your life, you can find someone or some kind of belief system that'll tell you that's okay. Um, 2 Timothy 4.3 says, a time is coming when people will not endure the truth or sound teaching, but they'll have itching ears and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and we'll turn away from listening, listening to the truth and wander off into myths. You know, we, set, we, we, we put, 
we look at the things, we, we curate things, we put things around us that tell us what we want to hear. And what we do is we build counterfeit truths in our life, yeah? And I love Nebuchadnezzar's response. It's really interesting that he won't let them do that. He won't let them give him a counterfeit truth. He wants the real uh, truth. Um, what are the sources of our truth, morality, and meaning? What are the, what are the, the sources that we use to define our truth, yeah? Um, are some of those given to us by Babylon, yeah? Are some of those given to us by the spirit of Babylon? Okay. Nebuchadnezzar is furious that, that they don't, they don't uh, answer him. And so he, uh, after uh, asking this of them, uh, he ends up saying, you know what? You guys are all gonna die. <laughs> and he basically says, gather all the wise men, gather all the magicians. You guys are all sentenced to death, including Daniel and his friends, yeah? Um, this got me thinking about this question. What do you do when you don't get answers and explanations that you're looking for, yeah? Like Nebuchadnezzar. What do you do? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't get the answers that he's looking for, and so he resorts to murder his way of controlling the situation, yeah? Point three, the spirit of Babylon demands explanation and exercises control. When we don't get the answers that we want, the spirit of Babylon, the influence on us uh, is to control our situations, control everything in our life, yeah? Especially when we don't get the answers that we want, yeah? And we demand these from God, we demand these from people. Um, we feel entitled to explanation, and a lot of times we even put God on trial. Uh, the Bible talks about this like the clay telling the potter, why did you make me like this, yeah? As if the clay tells the potter, you, ma you messed up. You made a mistake in how you're making me. You made a mistake in how you made uh, the world. You made a mistake in the way that you're redeeming us. Yeah, it's not the way I think it should be done. Yeah, and uh, when explanations aren't given, you know, when God is silent sometimes, or it's insufficient for us, he speaks something we don't want to hear, we tend to take matters into our own hands. And uh, like the second part, we, we give ourselves to counterfeit truths, yeah? Okay, now... Daniel was different, yeah? Daniel responded differently, yeah? Those are the three areas, three characteristics of Babylon. Daniel was able to thrive in this environment, and one of the ways he was able to, or the main way he was able to thrive was that he lived in the opposite spirit, yeah, that we see in Nebuchadnezzar and, and the magicians, yeah? When Daniel hears what the king's about to do, he actually goes to his friends. Uh, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, he goes to them and he calls a prayer meeting. He says, uh, go ahead and pray that God would give us mercy. Go and ask him for mercy, that he would speak to us the dream. One way that Daniel lives in the opposite spirit, uh, number one, he lives from a place of trust and dependence on God. Okay? Now, how did Daniel get to this point of dependence on God? Well, it actually has to deal with the situation he's in Daniel had everything taken from him, yeah? Uh, he was displaced, taken from home, forced to serve a perverse king. Everything was taken, including what we talked about last week. His name was taken from him, his identity, his purpose. And, and yet, Daniel remains uh, trusting God, yeah? Remains uh, depending on God, yeah? Continuing to pray. He hasn't stopped praying, Mother Teresa said this, you'll never know God is all that you need until he is all that you have. And just in opposition to the Babylonian spirit that's trying to keep what it has, Daniel has lost everything and he learned that the only thing he has is God. Yeah, the only thing that he can depend on is God. After this, God reveals the mystery to Daniel when they pray, yeah? God gives Daniel a dream, and he actually uh, has Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he goes, um, and I love this, uh, before he, he 
delivers the dream to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, there's this uh, little paragraph of worship and Daniel immediately thanks God and he declares God's wisdom and power. Number two, Daniel built his life on the truth. Uh, When he's declaring this, he declares God's sovereignty, believing in God's power, love, and goodness that God has actually given him the real dream. How many of you have ever been in the in-between place of God speaking to you something that you're asking him and then actually walking it out or actually seeing the fulfillment, yeah? Actually, some of you are there today. You've been spoken to. God's given you a word. He's given you a a solution, but it's not fulfilled yet, yeah? And you you don't really know if it's going to pan out, yeah? Um, That's where Daniel is, and I just love that he's already built his uh, trust, or he's already, already built his life that God is actually good. He's actually spoken, given the word, uh, and that he's going to be faithful. Yeah? So Daniel built his life on the sovereignty, the truth of God, believing that God isn't distant. He's telling, uh, he's faithful to reveal solutions. Daniel goes before the king, and he tells the king uh, the, the dream, and the king says, yes, this is the dream. And uh, Daniel gives the interpretation, and, the, and then uh, Nebuchadnezzar is blown away, right? He says, this is amazing, and I love this. Number three, Daniel submits to God's wisdom, and he looks to serve. I love this. Daniel doesn't go, yes, uh, I have the dream. I have the wisdom. I'm better than your magicians. I'm better than all your soothsayers uh, because I'm a Christian, because I'm a believer. I'm better than all them. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, God is wanting to speak to you. He's saying, God actually is speaking to you and he gave you this dream because he wants to speak to you. A wicked, perverse, cruel tyrant. God is wanting to share something with you. Daniel doesn't uh, lose sight of uh, his call to serve the king. He doesn't lose sight to serve, yeah? Opposite spirit. Rather than demanding God's answer, and then administering control of the situation. Yeah, he submits to God's wisdom and he serves. He uses it to serve, even the wicked king. There's a difference between asking from God in humility and faith than demanding from God in pride and fear. I've been trying to teach my kids this. Uh, My kids, uh, you know, they're just kids, and very regularly, they just say, give me that. Give me juice. <laughs> they go, give me juice, yeah? Or they go, give me that toy, yeah? And we stop them, and we say, hey, it's not bad to want the toy. It's not bad to, you know, ask, you know? But you're demanding the toy. We don't go through all this. We just say, hey, you got to ask us differently, yeah? And they, they, have, they know the routine. They say, oh, can I please have this? Um, we're, we're teaching our kids to acknowledge or to see a difference between uh, demanding and asking, between pride and humility, um, between asking out of understanding goodness and uh, asking out of fear, yeah, of loss. And so um, that's the same with God. Uh, it's not that God doesn't want things for us. Um, it's that he's producing a heart. He's producing a spirit in us. Yeah. Okay. Let's tie it up. Is everyone okay? Is everyone doing all right? Okay. Um, what enables Daniel to live in the opposite spirit? Um, you guys heard that verse before. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And um, I, I remember reading this years ago, and I felt like God revealed something to me. Um, I had this phrase, my faith is only as strong or as big as my hope. That the, the display of my faith, right, the way that I use my faith or act out on my faith, is, it correlates with what my hope is, how much hope I have, yeah? And um, for Daniel, his ability to live in the opposite spirit and to thrive in Babylon was that he has a hope. He has an anchor, uh, he's anchored in, in a hope, Yeah? We find this hope in 
uh, Daniel's interpretation of the dream. He actually shares the dream. We don't have time for all of it, but he shows Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's actually an image of a huge idol or a huge statue. And the statue is like a, it's like Nebuchadnezzar. It's like an image, a, a man. And each part of the body is made of a different element, yeah? Uh, gold, silver, bronze, uh, uh, iron, clay, yeah? And Daniel says that this uh, image represents the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms that will come after you, Babylon. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head, the gold, but following you, there's gonna be other empires that come after you, yeah? Um, and he, he uh, tells Nebuchadnezzar uh, that these are the kingdoms that, that, that will come. But then he says that there's a stone, yeah? That he saw a stone. And this stone is a stone not carved by human hands. Yeah, this stone comes from God and it shatters all these kingdoms. It shatters this image. And for Daniel, his hope is that God is gonna raise up a kingdom and he says this later, God is gonna raise up a kingdom that will never end. Yeah, um, I love this because uh, God is revealing the gospel to Daniel, 600 years before Jesus, yeah? We talk about uh, uh, Jesus as the rock, yeah? And Jesus said to build your house on the rock on who Jesus is. And we know this is a fulfillment of Jesus and his kingdom. I love this. Daniel's hope is the gospel, that God is gonna establish a kingdom that will never end, yeah? And that we don't need to be afraid of every type of kingdom that will ever emerge, yeah, in, in, in all of history's past and even continuing on, yeah, whether, you know, uh, we lose democracy in our world, right, or um, we see different ideologies or governance uh, emerge, God is saying this kingdom will not end, yeah, it will not stop, yeah. Um, God is establishing his kingdom his way, I love that the rock is what shatters it. It's not might, it's not wealth, it's not gold and silver. Uh, this made me think of, uh, there's a passage in Peter, 1 Peter, it says, you've been purchased not by perishable things, you've not been purchased by gold and silver and things that can uh, uh, disappear, but something greater, the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus. Yeah, and we know that the kingdom is inaugurated by our king who laid his life down for us. This is the kind of kingdom that God is gonna establish, a kingdom that's built on Jesus dying for us. Yeah, he initiates his kingdom by dying for us. Yeah, sacrificing his life. And this kingdom is gonna be marked by the same spirit, the same heart, yeah? The one that lays its life down, yeah? The one that humbles itself. I'm gonna end with this, uh, Jeremiah 29, and I just wanna read this, uh, this passage. Jeremiah um, was during the same time as Daniel, and he actually writes a letter to, to Daniel and writes the letter to the exiles uh, in Babylon, and this letter is awesome. Uh, he tells, uh, he tells uh, those in captivity, he says, thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 29, four, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Um, a lot of times when we're in a culture or society um, that doesn't go in line with, with our belief, with our faith, our truth, yeah, the truth. We either tend to separate ourselves completely from it. Yeah, we say, oh, we're not part of it. You guys are that and we are this, us and them. 
Uh, or we conform, yeah, we conform to the, the, the culture around us. Uh, God is calling us to transform, yeah? He's calling us not to conform, not to separate, but to transform. And for Daniel, the way that he thrives is being a faithful witness, yeah, uh, to what Jesus is like, a faithful witness to what God is like, yeah? And hopefully, um, we, we feel that call this morning. God has called Kailu Okona to, to thrive, yeah? He's called... Uh, his church to serve the city. And uh, even as we're, we're trying to church plant, I think that's been a concern of ours, really, how do we serve our city, yeah? He's calling us to serve our city. Um, and uh, it's anchored in our hope, yeah? Our hope isn't that we would gung-ho, crash down all the kingdoms of the world our way. Our hope is to do it God's way, and, 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 um, and he showed us that uh, he's gonna do it like Jesus, yeah? We're gonna do it like Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for a kingdom that will never end. And we just, even this morning, we declare uh, that Jesus, you are the king of kings. Like Nebuchadnezzar, falling on his face, he says, you are the king of all kings, your kingdom will never end. It will never fade, Jesus. And I just pray that you would uh, reveal to us your way, how you are gonna do this. How are you gonna establish your kingdom? And I pray that you would give us a heart like Daniel that served, that loved Babylon, a heart that trusted you in the midst of loss, a heart that's built on the truth and not counterfeits. I pray that you would, uh, would do that in us, Father, um, but that we would thrive as a faithful witness. We wanna represent you, Father. We wanna represent you, Jesus, rightly. Um, and so uh, even today, even this week, speak to our hearts. Where have we compromised? Where has uh, Babylon influenced us? And, and help us to, to live in the opposite spirit, Father. Uh, we just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, um, we have a, we could have the prayer ministers come up. Um, we have people here that would love to pray for you guys. Anyone, if you have any uh, prayer requests, prayer needs. Um, but have a good day. Next week, uh, I believe Daniel chapter three, uh, we'll be doing this uh, chapter by chapter. And I'll see you guys in like five weeks or four weeks.